The 8th the 8th of September, when Admiral Turner brought in Colonel Sims's 7th Marine Regiment, was a big day for Vandergrift's men. Although they had given the Japanese a thorough whipping on the Edson's Ridge only four days before, they wanted reinforcements badly, and the arrival of the 7th Marines made it possible to draw up a plan which the General called Active Defence. It was now known that the enemy's strength lay west of the Matanikau River, in a part of Guadalcanal made to order for defence, Steep, jungle-clad hills, kunai grass ridges commanding every approach, and deep woody ravines running down to the sea. As a cross-corridor advance would be very expensive and probably unsuccessful against an enemy in such terrain, Vandergrift's staff planned an enveloping movement from the interior. This they planned to start promptly in order to keep the Japanese off balance. Edson, now colonel of the 5th Marine Regiment, was in overall command, this operation made a bad start on the 23rd of September. Lieutenant Colonel Lewis Puller's 1st Battalion of the 7th Marines was given the inland route along the slopes of a series of hills, Grassy Ridge or Mount Austin, six miles southwest of Henderson Field. The land, furrowed like a crumpled wad of foolscap and matted with jungle growth like barbed wire, slowed the men to an exhausting crawl and the Japanese rushed down on them from Mount Austin. Unable to cross the Matanikau in the time allotted, Puller turned north to parallel the stream and reached the mouth at night on the 26th. The 1st Raider Battalion, now commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Griffith, was sent upstream from the mouth of the river that day to make a crossing at the Nippon Bridge. Lieutenant Colonel MacDougall's 2nd Battalion 5th Marines was poised at the river mouth, ready to assist either of the others. Before the raiders reached the bridge, the enemy, from the other side of a clearing, let loose a vicious fire which terminated Major Kenneth Bailey, one of the heroes of the Edson's Ridge. The only way to get at the enemy was to mount a steep, jungle-clad hill which commanded his position. It was a tough, four-hour climb up the hill, and after reaching the top, Griffith was severely wounded, and the raiders were recalled to the mouth of the Matanikau. It was now the 27th of September. In order to solve the impasse at the river, three companies of Puller's 1st Battalion under Major Otho L. Rogers embarked in Higgins' boats the same day to land west of Point Cruz, where, owing to a garbled transmission by portable radio, they supposed Griffith to be. They landed after a rough trip dodging air bombs, but had advanced only a quarter of a mile when Japanese troops got between them and the beach and terminated Major Rogers. The Marines deployed in a circle on a kunai grass knoll, to fend off attack from all directions, laying their undershirts on the ground to spell the word help. A friendly plane spotted the improvised ground panel and reported by radio to division headquarters, but a bomb had just plumped into headquarters and knocked out communications. Colonel Puller, suspecting that his men were in difficulties, boarded the destroyer Monsen at Kukum and steamed right over to Point Cruz that afternoon. When the beleaguered Marines sighted her, Sergeant Raysbrook stood in full view of the enemy, and arm signalled their situation to the ship. Puller ordered them to move down to the coast while Monson covered their withdrawal with a naval barrage. The two companies fought their way to the beach and established a tight defence ring. A Coast Guard petty officer, Douglas A. Munro, led in from Monson five Higgins boats, occupying the Japanese long enough with his two small boat guns to get the Marines clear, and in so doing lost his own life. Withering fire met the boats when they went in for a second load, so Henderson Field sent an SBD to make a strafing run and cover the retreat. This four-day exchange of unpleasantries near the Matanikau had cost the Marines 60 eliminated and 100 wounded, and gained nothing except experience. As one of the officers involved in it remarked to the writer, high commanders of ground forces are apt to lose their appreciation of time and distance, they forget how long it takes a column to move over tortuous ground, to climb rugged hills, and how long it takes for orders to be disseminated to the echelons that do the fighting. For the next ten days the Marines strung barbed wire, sowed landmines and sighted artillery in order to release men for a second attempt to secure the Matanikau. Six battalions were ordered to jump off on the 8th of October. The Japanese chose the same day to start a similar drive, a warming up for the monthly big show. General Hyakutake, in order to overwhelm the Marines, whose numbers he now estimated at 7,500, 
reverted to his original plan of throwing in 25,000 men, including Lieutenant General Maruyama's 2nd Division. Part of another division was left at Rabaul in readiness to move into New Guinea as soon as Hyakutake should receive van der Grift's surrender. His operation order even named the spot on the Matanikau where van der Grift was to appear with a white flag on or about the 15th of October. This is the decisive battle between Japan and the United States, read Maruyama's address to his troops on the 1st of October, a battle in which the rise or fall of the Japanese Empire will be decided. If we do not succeed in the occupation of these islands, no one should expect to return to Japan alive. Apparently, some of his men were becoming sceptical of this fanfaronade, judging from entries in captured Japanese diaries of a day or two later. For instance, where is the mighty power of the Imperial Navy? The strength of the enemy is increasing. The morale of our forces is going down. How long can we live on in this sort of a condition? When I think of it, the tears come out. The first step was to secure both banks of the Matanikau for the use of Maruyama's artillery. Colonel Nakaguma, commanding the 4th Infantry Regiment, brought his battalions into line on the west bank, ready to thrust across the river in two prongs, one inland and the other along the beach. But the Marines took the initiative. On the 7th of October, Two battalions of Colonel Edson's 5th Regiment swept forward along a front whose right flank rested on the shoreline. Before they reached the river, they flushed an advance enemy force and backed it into the bend a few hundred yards upstream from the river mouth. The raiders were brought forward on the 8th to deal with this group. In the meantime, Colonel Whaling's 3rd Battalion's 2nd Marine Regiment marched upstream and bivouacked near the coconut log Nippon Bridge. During the 8th of October, a day of heavy rain, both sides were bogged down in jungle mud. At nightfall, the Japanese, cooped up on the east bank, came out of their foxholes screeching, shooting and hurling grenades, mauled the raiders severely in hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and broke through to a river sandspit where they were held up by a wire barricade and finally wiped out. Vandergrift, seeing signs of the impending full-scale drive, decided to keep his reserves in the perimeter and ordered Edson to conclude his operation in a hurry. On the 9th of October, as the hot sun made the jungle steam and the marines sweat, Whaling's battalion crossed Nippon Bridge and marched down the west bank unopposed. Lieutenant Colonel Hanneken's 2nd Battalion 7th Marines followed, pushed a little farther to the westward, and then struck north to Matanikau village on the coast. They too found no nips. Where were they? Puller's battalion, which crossed third, probed along a trail about half a mile west of the river. As his men struggled over rugged ground, they suddenly came upon two ravines filled with Nakaguma's troops, whose weapons enfiladed the coast road but afforded them no protection inland. Puller by radio asked Del Valle's artillery to lay down a barrage on a group directly in his path, and at the same time turned his own mortars on a group farther west. The resulting shower was more than Japanese flesh could bear. Panic-stricken soldiers scrambled wildly up the slopes, where Puller's machine gunners sprayed them relentlessly, the survivors sliding back into the ravines to be chased up again by mortar and artillery fire. This grim routine continued until Puller had exhausted his ammunition and most of the human targets. A captured diary later revealed that 690 of Nakaguma's men had perished, most of them in the cul-de-sac. Late in the afternoon of the 9th of October, the attack force returned to the American lines, having lost 65 terminated and 125 wounded. Vandergrift left his 5th Regiment guarding the east bank of the Lower Matanikau as the key to his western defences, since the shore road was the only possible approach for enemy tanks and wheeled vehicles. His good judgment was later confirmed. Across Iron Bottom Sound, the 2nd Marine Regiment had been enjoying a relatively quiet tour of duty on Tulagi. The only operation of consequence began on the same day as Puller's victory. About 45 officers and men, under Lieutenant Colonel R.E., Bunker, Hill, were ferried to Aeola Bay, Guadalcanal, 30 miles east of Longa Point, where in a two-day operation, they wiped out a small Japanese base at the mouth of the Gurabusu River at small cost to themselves. Van der Grift could now disregard any enemy threat from the east. Despite Nakaguma's reverses, Japanese preparations for the big push continued. On the 9th of October, General Hyakutake landed on Guadalcanal to direct the campaign, and on the 11th ships came down the slot carrying heavy artillery 
and protected by a covering group of heavy cruisers. But they encountered Task Force 64, commanded by Rear Admiral Norman Scott, and the ensuing Battle of Cape Esperance was one of the most interesting of the campaign. This campaign of attrition was indecisive and unsatisfactory to both competitors in the bid for Guadalcanal supremacy. The American Navy in the South Pacific, still smarting from the sting of Savo Island and the loss of valuable carriers and destroyers, daily plagued by the submarine denizens of Torpedo Junction, longed for active retaliation. The Marines, embittered by the nocturnal hammerings of the Tokyo Express and the apparent paucity of the supply and reinforcement effort, grew increasingly restive. On board Japanese ships and around their campfires, there was an even stronger feeling of on to victory, since they disliked war in less than blitz tempo. At the very depth of this winter of our discontent came the battle off Cape Esperance, which, if far short of glorious summer, gave the tired Americans a heartening victory and the proud Japanese a sound spanking. Unwitting occasion of this naval battle was the 164th Infantry Regiment of the American Division, a former National Guard outfit from the Dakotas, now reinforced to about 2837 officers and men. The 164th constituted the next echelon of reinforcement for the hard-pressed Marines. Admiral Gormley, assuming that the Japanese would take a hostile view of the passage of this regiment from Noumea to Lunga Point, marshalled naval forces to give them constant protection and cover. The distant covering forces, three in number, consisted of Rear Admiral Murray's Hornet Carrier Group, Rear Admiral Lee's Washington Group, and Rear Admiral Norman Scott's Cruiser Group. It was this last on which fell the onus of blocking for Admiral Turner, who brought up the soldiers in Macaulay and Transport Zeilin, with eight destroyer-type escorts. On the 9th of October, this transport group sailed from Noumea. Course was set, pass north of San Cristobal, head west through Lengo Channel, and anchor in Lunga Roads on the morning of the 13th. Of the distant support forces, Hornet took station off Guadalcanal some 180 miles southwest of Henderson Field, Washington manoeuvred about 50 miles east of Malaita, and Norman Scott's team of 64 was poised in the vicinity of Rennell Island. Admiral Scott, flying his flag in San Francisco, considered himself lucky. He had orders from Admiral Gormley to protect the convoy by offensive action, to search for and destroy enemy ships and landing craft. It was the perfect assignment for an aggressive sailor. His staff was small, and to his liking, four young and ambitious lieutenants. Scott in three weeks had given his task force intensive training for night action, simulating battle conditions by keeping crews at stations from dusk to dawn, a Spartan procedure which taught them how to take it. He was ready to accept a night action, in which the enemy had hitherto shown superiority, and he intended to be master of the situation. His scheme was to stay outside the enemy's air range until noon, and then turn north to a position whence he could reach Savo Island before midnight. Scott, moreover, was one of the first task force commanders in the Pacific to enter combat with a carefully drawn battle plan. According to this plan, his ships were to steam in column with destroyers both ahead and astern. Destroyers were to illuminate with searchlight, fire torpedoes at large targets and guns at small targets. Cruisers were to open fire whenever they saw a target without waiting for orders. Cruiser planes would locate and illuminate the enemy with float lights. If the Japanese proved to be strong in destroyers, the force would be divided to reduce torpedo hazard. On 9 and the 10th of October, Admiral Scott made tentative advances toward Cape Esperance only to turn back when aerial reconnaissance reported no suitable targets. Admiral Mikawa's scheme required that troops be landed off the northwestern cape of Guadalcanal every night, while the marines were heckled with naval gunfire or aerial bombing. So far, he had been successful. Destroyers, carrying an average of 150 soldiers each, had on several occasions discharged as many as 900 men a night. But on the afternoon of the 8th of October, bombs from Henderson Field Flyers derailed the express so effectively that traffic down the slot was snarled for 24 hours. But on the 9th, about midnight, Tatsuta and five destroyers landed General Hyakutake and troops at Tassafaronga, despite a bombing by American aircraft en route. These attacks by Henderson Field Flyers sorely tried Admiral Mikawa's temper. He appealed to Vice Admiral Kusaka, 11th Air Fleet Commander at Rabaul, to do something. 
Kusaka offered to neutralise Henderson Field on the 11th if Mikawa would run express that day, and he was as good as his word. On the afternoon of the 11th of October, Henderson Field suffered a visitation of some 35 Japanese bombers protected by 30 fighters, but the former dumped their loads harmlessly in dense jungle, and the latter shot down only two American planes at a cost to themselves of four Zeeks and eight bombers. Yet they kept the American airmen so busy defending their base that Mikawa's southbound surface force was not molested. Fortunately, the long-legged patrol planes were not affected by this raid. It was a B-17 of Colonel L.G. Saunders's 11th Bombardment Group that first reported two cruisers and six destroyers tearing down the slot. Two more air contacts were made that afternoon. At 18.10, the enemy force was less than a hundred miles from Savo Island. Admiral Scott received this intelligence eagerly. He signalled his approach order, and at 16, throttlemen commenced building up speed to 29 knots. The enemy might reach Guadalcanal before midnight, but Scott would be there first. The search reports were correct as to enemy heading, but short as to strength. Mikawa had sent a bombardment group consisting of heavy cruisers, Aoba, Kinugasa and Furutaka, with two destroyers, and a reinforcement group, comprising seaplane carriers Nishin and Chitosi with six destroyers, to bring in troops and supplies. The bombardment ships, like Scots, had just completed several days' tactical and target practice in the shortlands. Mikawa considered this a routine mission and let the cruiser division commander, Rear Admiral Goto, take the command. On board Scott's speeding vessels, sunset was marked by bugles and boatswain's pipes, followed by, All hands man your battle stations. Sailors moved to their action posts on the double. Steel doors clanged shut. Over the complex telephone circuits, reports streamed to the department heads, and from them to the quiet bridges. Bridge, bat two, manned and ready for general quarters. Bridge, gunnery department, manned and ready for general quarters. Bridge, Damage control, manned and ready for general quarters, condition Z set throughout the ship. Bridge, engineer department, manned and ready for general quarters, condition Z set, boilers one, two, three on the line. As the tropical darkness shut down, Admiral Scott swept his eyes upward and around the horizon, sky slightly overcast, the sliver of a new moon just setting, a smooth sea ruffled gently by a 14-knot southeast breeze, a dark horizon brightened at intervals by flashes of distant lightning. Good weather for surprise. He knew his radar would be handicapped by the proximity of land, but the enemy had no radar. On the other side of the world, at New York and Norfolk, mighty forces were starting for North Africa. They had so much and he so little. Well, he'd show those fat boys of the Atlantic fleet that Sopak could win victories on a shoestring. The Americans approached wide around the western coast of Guadalcanal. Shortly after, 21 course was changed from north-northwest to north. Half an hour later, speed was reduced to 25 knots, then to 20. High on cruiser catapults, pilots and crewmen groped in the darkness, readying planes for launching. Scott, knowing what Mikawa had done at Savo Island, intended to employ his four kingfishers to track the enemy. Two of the planes swooshed down the catapult tracks and flew off into the night, but Salt Lake City lost hers through the accidental ignition of aircraft flares in the fuselage, and Helena never got the word to launch, and so dumped hers right overboard as an inflammable hazard. At 22.28, Cape Esperance bearing southeast by east, 14 miles, Scott headed for Sinister Savo, intending to skirt the coast and contact the enemy if possible, before he could effect a landing but at any rate to contact him. When the Salt Lake plane took its fiery plunge, Admiral Gotto's bombardment group was more than 50 miles northwest of Scott's. His heavy cruisers were in column, with one destroyer on each beam of the leading flagship. The disposition was set up like a giant T, rushing head foremost down the slot at 26 knots. His sailors were so preoccupied with navigating those black waters and with preparations for the bombardment that when vigilant lookouts sighted the far distant glare of the burning American plane, all brains on the flag bridge assumed it to be a signal from the beachhead or from the seaplane carriers. They answered with blinker, too dim for the Americans to see. Lack of reply made some of the officers suspicious, but Gotto continued to flash his signal search, lights hoping to lure away from the landing area any American forces that might be about. 
He did not really expect an attack. It was Savo Island again, but in reverse. Aircraft again gave the warning, but this time it was the Japanese who brushed it off. At 2228, as we have seen, Admiral Scott changed course to head directly for Savo Island. Seven minutes later, he ordered his ships to execute the battle plan and form single column. Destroyers Fahrenholt, Duncan and Laffey were in the van. Cruisers San Francisco, Boise, Salt Lake City and Helena in the centre. Destroyers Buchanan and Michaela in the rear. Entering a night sea battle is an awesome business. The enveloping darkness, hiding the enemy's agents of destruction, seems a living thing, malignant and oppressive. Hardened shellback and timid pollywog alike hate to fight blind. Swishing water at bow and stern mark an inexorable advance toward an unknown destiny. Men speak seldom and then only in short, clipped sentences. The gunners who perpetually fiddle with the complicated mechanism of their pieces, the navigators pricking off chart positions and the engineers manipulating valves are gratefully occupied, but hundreds just stand at battle stations and think long thoughts. Each sailor looks at his nearest shipmate, saying with his eyes, What is going to happen? What will I be required to do? How well will I do it? In the American task force, there was a slackening of taut nerves when San Francisco's spotting plane sent in a radio report at 2250. One large, two small vessels, one six miles from Savo off Northern Beach, Guadalcanal. We'll investigate closer. At last, something for a man to put his teeth into. But Admiral Scott was not sure. Were all these ships together? Might they not be friendly craft? If unfriendly, where were the remaining Japanese ships reported that afternoon? Actually, the ships sighted by the cruiser plane were of Joshima's reinforcement group, within Savo Sound. Goto's fighting ships were at this time 30 miles northwest of Cape Esperance. Scott, fearing lest his course take him dangerously close to the shore, ordered column left to northeast to pass six miles to the westward of Savo Island. His intention was to locate that large enemy force. Failing in that, he would go in after the small fry off Cape Esperance. As the column left was executed at 2308, there was still no definite contact with the enemy by Scott's ships. At 2325, the first radar waves bounced off a Japanese hull and back to Helena, who was equipped with the new SG search radar. The target bore 315 degrees, distant 27,700 yards. An early plot of this ship separated into three, moving southeast at 20 knots. Unfortunately, flagship San Francisco, equipped with radar of an earlier eccentric type, the SC was unable to duplicate Helena's interesting finds, and Helena did not report her contacts for 15 minutes. Furthermore, Admiral Scott knew that the Japanese had radar receivers capable of detecting his SC transmissions, and so could track any ship making them. Accordingly, he had forbidden the use of SC radar in his force, and the flagship's gunnery radars, supposedly covering the 180-degree sector ahead, failed to pick up the enemy three points forward of the port beam. Nor did Boise's spotting plane help, since engine trouble forced it down near Savo Island at 2330. The only hot intelligence that reached Scott was an amplifying report from San Francisco's search plane at 2330, to the effect that the one large and two small vessels previously reported had now moved 16 miles eastward along Guadalcanal. These again were Joshima's, not Goto's ships that Scott was seeking. Scott weighed the evidence and decided to continue covering the passage between Savo Island and Cape Esperance. In so doing, he should intercept either the force approaching or the other one retiring along Guadalcanal. To do either, he must now reverse course. His signal to countermarch, left to course 230 degrees, went out over voice radio a few seconds after 2330. In this manoeuvre, the cruisers, led by the flagship, reverse course by column movement. The rear destroyers follow in the same water as the cruisers, but the van destroyers make a separate column movement and then increase speed to resume their former positions in the van. There was nothing unusual in ordering this somewhat complicated procedure, but in close proximity to the enemy of which Scott was ignorant, the execution of it very nearly cost him the ensuing battle. At 23.32 the signal was executed, San Francisco starting her wide turn to the left, followed by Boise, Salt Lake City, Helena and the two rear destroyers. Captain Robert G. Tobin, squadron commander in Fahrenholt, 
led his three van destroyers in a separate column movement, slowed down to make sure that it was proceeding according to book, then increased speed and came up on the starboard side of the cruiser column. For ten minutes after the countermarch, Helena's SG radar tracked the suspected enemy. Then Captain Hoover, certain of his analysis, informed the task force commander of a target six miles away, bearing 285 degrees. This was disturbing news to Scott. His flagship had no radar contacts. Captain Tobin's destroyers were somewhere out in the darkness, not yet back in column. Boise, who had detected the enemy group at 2338, contributed to Scott's bewilderment by reporting five bogies bearing 65 degrees relative, 295 degrees true. Now, bogey meant unidentified aircraft, but Boise meant to say unidentified ships. The Admiral guessed she did, but was not certain. And several of his commanding officers missed a few words of the message, receiving the bearing merely as 65 degrees. Did that mean a true compass bearing or relative to the course of the cruiser, a difference of some 130 degrees? With the bearing understood as true, the message made no sense compared with Helena's. Both cruisers' radars might be merely recording Tobin's destroyers. Boise's contacts might be either surface or air, either on the port quarter or the starboard bow. The first step in clarification must be to locate Tobin. Scott voiced a query to the squadron commander. Are you taking station ahead? Captain Tobin, aware that his three destroyers were in a dangerous and awkward position, attempted to dispel doubt by replying, Affirmative, coming up on your starboard side. Farenholt by that time was abreast the centre of the cruiser column, but, unknown to Tobin, Duncan was no longer astern of him. She alone of the destroyers had recorded suspicious indications to the westward with her fire control radar just before the countermarch, and when the course change was more than half completed, these contacts strengthened and closed to four miles' range. Duncan's skipper saw Farenholt apparently steady on a westerly course and assumed that Tobin had seen what he saw and was closing to attack. He bent on thirty knots and pointed Duncan's bow in the direction of the radar contacts. The third destroyer, Laffey, observed Duncan's aberration but steadied her helm and followed Farenholt. Admiral Scott's concern for his destroyers was amply warranted. By fifteen minutes before midnight, his four cruisers with destroyers Buchanan and McCalla were in column on the new southwesterly course at twenty knots. Farenholt was on a parallel course about eight hundred yards to starboard with Laffey closing from astern. Duncan was charging in to attack the enemy single-handed. San Francisco had just made her first radar contact bearing 300 degrees distant, 5,000 yards. Was it the enemy or one of Tobin's destroyers? There was no doubt in the minds of Helena's gunners. Their new SG radar persistently tracked the original contacts. With the range down to 5,000 yards, word reached the bridge. Ships visible to the naked eye. Now the old communications jinx bedeviled Scott's task force. On the voice radio, Captain Hoover broadcast a two-word signal, interrogatory Roger, which meant request permission to open fire. It so happened that the code word Roger was employed also to acknowledge receipt of a voice transmission, and on the flag bridge of San Francisco, Hoover's question was interpreted as a mere request for acknowledgement of a previous message. So Scott answered, Roger, intending to indicate message received but an unqualified Roger also meant commence firing. To be certain, Captain Hoover repeated his inquiry and received the same one-word response. It was a sardonic paradox of the signal book that both Scott and Hoover were correct, yet victims of a word owning several meanings. Captain Hoover, however, extracted from Roger the meaning he wanted, and at 2346, Helena opened fire with her six-inch main battery and her five-inch guns also. While Scott was trying to resolve these various perplexities, his Japanese counterpart remained oblivious to everything except the execution of his bombardment mission. The Americans need not have fretted about radar-controlled torpedo attacks or interception of radar transmissions. Admiral Goto had no radar and never suspected the proximity of enemy forces. He was almost precisely in the situation of the American cruisers on the other side of Savo Island two months earlier, Telltale warnings discounted, all guns secured fore and aft, ignorant there was a battle on until hit. 
and Helena's first salvo, or perhaps her second, hit and hit hard. The other ships were quick to follow suit. Salt Lake City, her eight-inch sights laid on an enemy cruiser broad on her starboard bow and only 4,000 yards distant, was only seconds behind Helena with gunfire and star shell, and one Japanese ship was only seconds behind her, getting a hit on Salt Lake that eliminated several men. Boise, next ahead, laid her six-inch guns on the cruiser column while her anti-aircraft batteries barked at destroyer Hatsuki on the left flank. San Francisco picked on a cruiser which her lookouts reported 4,800 yards distant. The destroyers, too, were quick to fire. Fahrenholt, with friendly cruiser shells screaming overhead, concentrated on the enemy column. Laffey, caught in the line of cruiser fire, went emergency full speed astern and turned hard left, intending to fall in astern of Helena. Three of her five-inch guns raked Aoba, while a fourth lighted the Japanese with star shell. Duncan, on her lone assault, found herself less than a mile from the Japanese, enemy ships closing her rapidly and on both sides. Her skipper, Lieutenant Commander Taylor, manoeuvred desperately to avoid friendly gunfire and unmask his torpedo batteries. Swinging right, he recognised Furutaka by her slender nod to stack. The cruiser, too, turned right and in so doing opened range, which was not to Taylor's taste. He ordered hard left rudder to pursue, pumped several gun salvos into Furutaka, and then shifted fire to an enemy destroyer, probably Hatsuyuki. Duncan was now in a precarious position in the line of fire between the two forces, as a shell hit in Num 1 fire room indicated. It still lacked 13 minutes of midnight. Admiral Scott now made a serious mistake, from the best of motives. Convinced by the position of his destroyers, by the deceptive similarity of silhouettes and by lack of radar intelligence that his cruisers were firing on American destroyers, he ordered cease firing at 2347, only one minute after Helena had fired her first salvo. But the gods were laughing at both sides that night. Fantastic as it may seem, the startled and confused Japanese admiral fumbled to a similar conclusion that he was being shot at by the Japanese supply force. He ordered a column movement to the right. Seconds later, he was mortally wounded by one of an avalanche of shells exploding around Aoba's bridge. Little could Goto have done to extricate his ships. Scott had inadvertently achieved the classic crossing of the T, enabling his guns to enfilade an enemy unable in that position to fight back. Goto's column movement unmasked his own gun batteries, but permitted the Americans to concentrate on each ship in succession as it approached the knuckle of white water at the turning point. Nor did Scott's order to stop shooting save the enemy. Aoba and Furutaka were now burning from numerous hits, and the enthusiastic American gunners were slow to comply with their admiral's command. Some never did. Scott repeated the unpopular order several times and personally visited the bridge of San Francisco to ensure compliance by his own flagship. Then, by voice radio, he asked Tobin the vital question, How are you? Tobin replied that he was all right and was taking his ships up ahead on the starboard side. Scott, still not satisfied, wanted to know if his cruisers had been shooting at Tobin's destroyers. The squadron commander replied, I don't know who you were firing at. Still uncertain, Scott ordered Tobin's three ships to flash their battle recognition lights. Lights green over green over white in a vertical position flickered momentarily to starboard. Satisfied at last and four minutes had elapsed, Scott at 23.51 ordered resume firing. During this four-minute partial lull in American shooting, the surprised and uncertain Japanese returned a desultory and ineffective fire. Aoba with difficulty negotiated a 180-degree right turn. Furutaka, caught with several salvos at the turning point, staggered drunkenly in Aoba's wake, turrets and torpedo tubes immobilized by American shellfire. Captain Masao Sawa of Kinugasa unwittingly turned left in the wrong direction, thereby saving his ship. So did destroyer Hatsuyuki. When Admiral Goto was mortally wounded, the command devolved upon his senior staff officer, Captain Kikunori Kijima. The effects of surprise were now wearing off. It would be only a few moments before the astonished Japanese would bare their fangs and strike. A hit in Duncan's fire room was probably the first serious one received by any United States ship, and she collected plenty more. A second hit knocked out the gun director, but Duncan continued to shoot on local control and launched one torpedo at Furutaka. 
The torpedo officer, Lieutenant Robert L. Fowler, USNR, was mortally wounded, but Chief Torpedoman Boyd quickly aimed and fired another torpedo at the cruiser. Duncan sailors reported seeing Furutaka crumble in the middle, then roll over and disappear. Unfortunately, this was an illusion, and the same salvo that felled Lieutenant Fowler knocked over the forward stack and started a fire in the number two ammunition handling room. The skipper, acutely conscious of his situation, turned on battle recognition lights. It was too late. Another salvo, probably American, put lights and ship out of action. Fahrenholt was hit about the same time as Duncan, two shots exploding in the rigging to pepper the superstructure with a hail of jagged fragments. Shortly thereafter, her hull was hit. A gaping hole just above the waterline flooded gun plot, destroying communications and gunfire control wiring. Another shot pierced the forward fire room, releasing a cloud of scalding steam which drove the crew topside. Since these hits were on the port side, away from the enemy, and were recorded as apparently six-inch, it seems regrettably certain that Fahrenholt too was the victim of American gunfire. When Captain Sock McMorris of San Francisco received Admiral Scott's orders to resume fire, the attention of his lookouts and gunners was attracted by an unidentified warship steaming a parallel course only three quarters of a mile to the westward. This strange craft flashed a combination of red and white lights, signalled indistinguishable characters for a minute or two, and then turned right. The cruiser snapped open searchlight shutters and disclosed the typical latticework foremast and white-banded second stack of destroyer Fubuki. All Scott's ships attacked Fubuki so fiercely that she stopped completely, exploded, and sank at about 2353. Admiral Scott, now rid of uncertainty and furiously eager to let no enemy escape, at 2355 swung his column to the northwest to parallel the Japanese. During this course change, two or three shells nicked Boise, but did little damage. She, Salt Lake City and Helena were tracking targets and shooting, but it is now impossible to tell which enemy vessels were favoured by their attentions. Buchanan and McCalla, the rear destroyers, pulled into range of the same highly attractive targets. Commander Wilson of the former shot the works, a steady stream of five-inch bullets and five torpedoes, Lieutenant Commander Cooper of Macalla sighted Aoba and Furutaka burning, their guns still trained amidships, and slugged away at them with his main battery. At 2354, a torpedo from either Buchanan or Duncan struck Furutaka's forward engine room, but failed to sink or even to stop her. Laffey fired no torpedoes during the battle, but was one of those that ganged up on Fubuki, and after she sank, chased destroyer Hatsuyuki out of sight with gunfire. Precisely at midnight, Admiral Scott ordered all ships to cease firing. It appeared to him that some shaking down was necessary in order to continue our attack successfully. Again, a number of gunnery officers and gunners turned deaf ears to this order. All ships were directed to flash recognition lights and form column. All complied, excepting crippled Fahrenholt and Duncan, and the stern chase commenced. Sunday the 11th ended unhappily for the Imperial Navy. Cruiser Furutaka crawled toward her grave 22 miles northwest of Savo Island. A swirl of bubbling water and a few floating survivors were all that remained of destroyer Fubuki. Cruiser Aoba was on fire. Cruiser Kinugasa and destroyer Hatsuyuki, the only whole survivors, were in flight. Admiral Goto was dying. And seven undamaged American ships, led by a purposeful admiral, were intent on making the 12th of October memorable for something besides Columbus Day but the Japanese were still full of fight. At the same instant that Scott ordered his formation to cease firing, Kinugasa opened up on the American cruisers 8,000 yards to the southward. Sailors in the American flagship had an unwanted thrill when a typical Japanese tight salvo pattern straddled their wake. Boise had another when torpedoes launched by the enemy cruiser at 12.01 a.m. were spotted on a collision course. Sailors below decks, informed of the torpedo's approach, sweated the seconds out while Captain Mike Moran ordered hard right rudder and successfully combed the wakes. After this skilful manoeuvre, Boise returned to column. Shortly thereafter, her radar gave notice of a target just abaft the starboard beam. Boise directed a searchlight at it and quickly opened gunfire, but the light gave her position away and the enemy ship, probably Elba, returned fire with good effect puncturing Boise's hull in four places. 
At the same time, Kinugasa found the American searchlight a superb point of aim, and for three minutes Boise was given a demonstration of accurate Japanese gunnery. Near misses closely bracketed her, and two eight-inch hits inflicted cruel damage. The enemy had her in a groove. She was only saved by Salt Lake City, the next ship astern, turning right deliberately and interposing herself between the burning Boise and the enemy. A courageous move, this, on the part of Captain Small. Foolhardy, some would call it. But he silenced one of the ships that was pounding Boise and gave Moran a chance to turn hard left at 12.12am and pull free. San Francisco, like Boise, first fired at a target some 7,000 yards away, until her gunners, through the smoke, briefly sighted and attacked Kinugasa with radar-controlled gunfire. Aoba, too, was roughly handled by the American cruisers, collecting some 40 hits, but Furutaka was still underway, although listing heavily to port. Hatsuyuki was scarcely touched. After Boise left the formation, Salt Lake continued her duel with Kinugasa until 12.16 a.m. with no great damage to either. That Japanese cruiser received only four hits during the battle. Salt Lake was hit twice, but fortunately the enemy ammunition was not up to snuff. Armour turned one eight-inch shell away, and the other exploded with a low order of detonation in a fire room, eliminating one man and starting an oil fire that did extensive damage to electrical equipment. In this furious night clash there were few men who could qualify as spectators only. None of our ships were air-conditioned, and ventilation was nil with Condition Z set. Temperature below rose to over 150 degrees F, and sailors working in closed compartments heard little and saw less. Men on darkened bridges were too engrossed in keeping station on the black loom of ships ahead. No easy task this, to apprehend a sudden speed and course change through the blinding flash and smoke of forward guns. Gun control crews, like men with tunnel vision, saw only the target under fire, viewing it down a long lane of tracers. The gunners themselves kept their eyes on dial, valve or powder case. Each team member had a single special function. But as the battle reached its climax, two men in San Francisco's scout plane saw the whole thing as a panorama. The pilot, Lieutenant John A. Thomas, flew over the antagonists where his flares and float lights could be used if requested. He reported his presence, inquired in which direction the Americans were firing and circled to await orders. Against an ocean glistening with a delicate sheen from star shell, he saw red ribbons of tracer fire, the white thin cones of searchlight beams, the sullen red glow of hits, the multicoloured fountains raised by shell splashes, more beautiful than any grandes o of a princely park. Then Boise's punishment began. A massive orange blossom of flame arose from her, unfolding as it flew skyward. Goodbye, Boise, thought Lieutenant Thomas. Boise was indeed in dire peril. One eight-inch shell had penetrated num one turret, exploding within and setting fire to the gun chamber. Another had entered the hull nine feet below the waterline to detonate in a forward six-inch magazine. Blast, penetrating all the forward magazines, propelled flames and gas up through the handling rooms and two forward turrets. Magazine and handling room crews were wiped out to a man. The flames, gaining access to the forecastle through the turret openings, scorched more men to death and enclosed the entire forward part of the ship. Captain Moran gave the order to flood forward magazines, but the men at the flood control panel were no more. It seemed even to him that his ship was lost. At any moment, the tons of explosives in magazines would destroy her like Britain's ill-fated battlecruiser Hood. But the luck of the Irish prevailed. Enemy shell had so ripped Boise's hull that seawater did what deceased men could not do. It flooded her magazines and quenched the flames. Even so, she was definitely out of the fight. By 12.20 a.m. fire had ceased. During the last of it, other ships had strayed from the column to avoid torpedo wakes. Admiral Scott, fearing lest those in the rear mistake San Francisco for the enemy, terminated the pursuit at 12.28 a.m. by changing course from N.W. to S.S.W. and set about collecting his flock. Most ships answered and indicated their positions by flashing recognition lights, but repeated calls by voice radio got no reply from Boise, Farrenholter Duncan. Destroyer Macalla was ordered to assist them. Shortly after his last change of course, the Admiral warned, Stand by for further action. The show may not be over. But over it was. By 1 a.m. Helena, Laffey and Buchanan were back in formation with the flagship. 
Boise, although trailing streamers of flame from her devastated bow, lost little speed. Her retirement was made good at 20 knots while damage control parties wrestled with the double problem of mastering both fire and flooding. By 2.40, all fires were out, shaky bulkheads were shored, underwater holes stuffed with bedding, submersible pumps chuffing effectively. Captain Moran eased his ship into column astern of San Francisco, justly proud of his crew's magnificent damage control effort. But she had lost 107 officers and men, and 35 more were wounded. Farenholt, damaged in the first minutes of the action, was handicapped by flooding through shell holes on the waterline. By pumping oil and water and shifting topside weights, the crew listed the ship nine degrees to starboard, which brought the holes clear of water. Inclined to this jaunty angle, Farenbolt scampered out of the battle zone at twenty knots, escorted by the newly arrived destroyer Aaron Ward. With day at hand, Admiral Scott called for and received air coverage from Rear Admiral Fitch's land-based aircraft, a wise but unneeded precaution. As no Japanese planes appeared, he set about recovering cruiser planes from Tulagi and escorting cripples. Duncan had but a few hours left of life's fitful fever. The details of her death struggle had no influence on the battle, but we shall tell them as an example of what destroyer sailors did and suffered that night, and on many other nights. She had been out of action since the beginning of the engagement. One shell burst terminated everyone in the chart house. Fragments from another slew men on both the bridge and the gun director platform. The main radio, coding, radar plotting, gunnery plotting and interior communications rooms were demolished. Forward fire room, damaged by a previous hit, was the goal of another shell. This additional havoc, added to fires already raging on the forecastle, turned the forward third of the ship into a white-hot cauldron. The starboard wing of the bridge was isolated by fires forward and aft and to port and below, and the fires were closing in on it. Lieutenant Commander Taylor, after trying in vain to communicate with the after part of his ship, ordered bridge abandoned by the only possible rote, over the side and into the water. Duncan still had way on, steaming in aimless circles at about fifteen knots, when the wounded were lowered into the water and the able-bodied followed. From a life raft, Taylor watched his ship steam away, uncontrolled. There were still plenty of men on board. Gunners had continued to shoot the afterguns until targets disappeared out of sight and range. Ensign Frank A. Andrews had then left his gun for the afterconning station and established communication with the engineer officer, Lieutenant Herbert R. Cabat, now senior officer on board. Andrews and Chief Torpedoman Boyd attempted to beach the ship on Savo Island, then gave up the idea when diminishing fires suggested that the ship might be saved. The crew made a game fight and might have succeeded, but for the spread of the conflagration below decks. Men were gradually driven from the forward engine room. The after-fire room was unable to obtain needed boiler feed water. Steam pressure dropped rapidly. Without steam, no power. Without power, no pumps. Lieutenant Wade H. Coley, USWR, and Chief Water Tender A. H. Holt attempted to run a boiler on seawater pumped in by a gasoline hand billy. It was no use. Cold water boiled into steam and backed up into the pump. The medical officer made his way through heavy smoke towards sick bay to get a few needed drugs, and disappeared. One group of men in the flaming midship section dropped over the side, watched the ship slow to a stop, then swam back to assist in the firefighting. Heroic efforts were not enough, and at two, with flames swarming over the topsides and ammunition exploding, Duncan was abandoned. Life jackets, floats, empty powder cans, any and every buoyant material were pressed into service to keep the survivors floating. During the remaining hours of darkness, the swimmers unhappily watched the explosions of their beloved ship. At the time of abandonment, M.F. Kala was in the vicinity searching for Boise. Lieutenant Commander Cooper made a wary approach on a burning wreck so shrouded with fire and smoke that she was hard to identify. At three, a boat was lowered with a party, under the executive officer, which boarded the ship and made a cursory examination. The exec thought she could be saved, and for two hours his men tried. McCalla, in the meantime, was looking for Boise and did not return until daybreak. She then fished the waters to the west of Savo Island, competing with sharks for human lives. The sharks, lured by the bright aluminum powder cans serving as lifebuoys, were slashing viciously at the helpless human bait. 
Michaela sailors drove off several of the brutes with rifle fire. The result of their rescue effort was most gratifying. 195 officers and men from Duncan recovered, as against 48 lost. Salvage efforts by McCalla's men were not successful. Shortly before noon, progressive flooding got Duncan down to main deck level, the salvage party abandoned her, and she sank six miles north of Savo Island. Destroyer Hatsuyuki stood by Furutaka until she went down, and cruisers Aoba and Kinugasa retired up New Georgia Sound, the 40 hits on Aoba no deterrent to high speed. Captain Kijima told the expiring Admiral Goto that he could die happy because two United States heavy cruisers had been sunk. The Orientals were miserably apprehensive of an American air attack at daybreak, and at seven it came, but the planes from Henderson Field failed to make a hit. By mid-morning the three surviving ships were anchored off Shortland Island. Kinugasa returned to action within 24 hours. Aoba went home for major repairs. Hatsuyuki had suffered only minor damage. While Admiral Goto fought, Admiral Joshima landed men, stores and 150mm guns from his reinforcement group near Kokumbona. At 2.30, the drifting float plane that belonged to Boise sighted these ships steaming swiftly out of the sound. Destroyers Shirayuki and Murakumo returned to recover survivors from Goto's group, rescued 400 Japanese from the water, but broke off when an American destroyer hove into sight. They tried to entice the American into a chase within range of Japanese aircraft, but got a reverse twist on that. Murakumo, while jammed with survivors, became a victim of Henderson Field dive bombers and fighters, and had to be scuttled. Relief destroyer Natsugumo later in the day suffered a similar fate from the weapons of these same aviators. The only counter-move of the Japanese on the 12th was an unsuccessful effort of submarine Trand, Two to attack Mikaela, still scouring the waters north of Savo for signs of life. At 14.30, this destroyer sighted a large cluster of close-shaven Japanese heads. Lines were thrown to the enemy sailors, but they preferred sharks to survival. Mikaela men forcibly captured three struggling samples. Minesweepers Hovi and Trevor, out from Tulagi, snared 108 more unwilling nips on the 13th, Captain Kijima, OTC of the Japanese bombardment group after the death of Goto, wished he had shared the Admiral's fate. Despite his claim of having sunk two heavy cruisers and one destroyer, he was promptly relieved by order of Admiral Mikawa. He and his fellow officers had reason to lose face. Proceeding as they were on an offensive mission, they should have been reasonably alert. They would have been annihilated, except for the confusion caused by Scott's countermarch and Kinugasa's wrong but lucky turn to the north. Admiral Scott, on the contrary, became the hero of the South Pacific during the short month that remained of his valiant life. The Navy in general, misled by over-optimistic reports of commanding officers in accepting a score of four cruisers and four destroyers sunk, regarded Cape Esperance as adequate revenge for Savo Island. As West Coast yards were crowded, Captain Moran was ordered to bring Boise to Philadelphia for repairs. There she was accorded an enthusiastic welcome, unfortunately marred by a journalist's nickname of this gallant cruiser as the One Ship Task Force, grossly unfair to other participants whose names were withheld for security reasons. Salt Lake City was repaired at Pearl Harbor before going on to greater glory in the Aleutians. Norman Scott fought the Battle of Cape Esperance with a cool, determined courage, Despite the trouble caused by an intricate countermarch, he never let the situation deteriorate into a melee. His ignorance of the varying capabilities of different types of radar was almost universal in the United States Navy in 1942. Later, commanders learned that proper use of radar could eliminate the searchlights and recognition lights which attracted enemy gunfire, as a candle attracts moths. Unfortunately, because it is human to conclude that the result justifies the means, some fallacious conclusions were drawn from this battle. Thus, Scott was convinced that his long single-column formation was all right and that American gunfire could master any night battle situation. Actually, his disposition was dangerously unwieldy and prevented the destroyers from exploiting their proper weapon, the torpedo. And because the surprised enemy did not get off his usual torpedo attack, that was assumed to be no longer a serious threat. So, because we won the Battle of Cape Esperance, 
serious tactical defects were carried over into subsequent engagements with unfortunate results. One learns more from adversity than from success. Savo Island was a victory for the Japanese, but the American transports were not touched. Cape Esperance was an American victory, but the Japanese accomplished their main object. Not only did fresh troops get ashore at Tassafaronga while Goto and Scott were fighting, but seaplane carriers Nishin and Chitose unloaded heavy artillery, which meant trouble for the Marines. Nor did Scott's victory prevent the Japanese from inflicting a heavy air raid on Henderson Field on the 12th of October, fortunately with very bad aim, or the heaviest bombardment yet two nights later, unfortunately with very good aim. Cape Esperance helped American morale, spared the Marines one night of bombardment, and punctured Japanese confidence in their superiority at night fighting. Providence abandoned us and our losses mounted, says one of their official reports, but the decisive naval battle of the Solomons was yet to be fought. Sunrise the 13th of October revealed the grey hulls of Admiral Turner's transports, bringing up the 164th Infantry Regiment of the American Division, a heartening sight for Marines particularly for the 1st Raider Battalion, which was scheduled to provide these transports with return passengers. Out on the fringes of the perimeter, things were looking much better. Patrols pushed to the west of the Matanikau River without hindrance. On Henderson Field, also there was cause for optimism. Ninety operational aircraft, about equally divided between dive bombers and fighters, were scattered in the dispersal areas, and though the gasoline supply was low replacement, prospects were good. Events shortly proved that American optimism was premature. At noon, about 24 Japanese bombers, flying nearly six miles high, made an unexpected and accurate bombing run over Henderson Field. Two hours later, while American fighter planes were fueling, 15 more bombers came in and left the field looking like a slice of Swiss cheese. No sooner had the Seabees filled the holes than a new and disgusting Japanese character made his bow with a shrill whine followed by an explosive thud smack in the middle of the airstrip. This was Pistol Pete, the heavy field artillery unloaded on the 11th, and now laid on Henderson from well-concealed positions beyond the Matanikau. When he opened up again on the evening of the 13th of October, destroyers Sterrett, Gwyn and Nicholas, covering the unloading, took him under fire and silenced him, though not for long. While this was going on, Japanese naval officers were talking on the darkened flag bridge of battleship Congo, headed for Guadalcanal. Vice Admiral Takeo Kurita, Combative 3, discusses with his staff gunnery officer, Commander Yanagi, the details of an interesting operation planned for that night. Over 914-inch bombardment shells are ready in battleships Congo and Haruna, but less than 300 of them are the thin-skinned high-explosive kind especially designed to challenge Marines and their planes. The rest, all armour-piercing, may not even explode against soft ground and yielding coconut palms, and at best will only blow a big hole in the ground. The two officers review their plan carefully. Four destroyers, already sweeping ahead of the battleships, will give warning of any ships in the area, then torpedo them. The battleships, screened by light cruiser Izzu and four or five destroyers, will pass between Santa Isabel and Florida Islands, leaving Savo Island on the port hand, and catapult float planes for gunfire spot. Then watch the fireworks. Shortly before midnight, the drone of a low-powered observation plane is heard over Henderson Field, and at a few minutes after 1am, October 14th, 16 14-inch guns break the silence with monstrous thunder which echoes from the mountains of Guadalcanal. A bright, unwinking flare descends from the observation plane, affording the aviator and Japanese observers in the hills a sharply defined picture of the airfield. The first shells plant orange-red seeds of flame to mark the target. Kurita's fire control parties calculate range data and apply corrections radioed in from plane pilots and land observers. The admiral and his gunnery officer note with growing elation how each salvo starts new blazes, until the entire airfield is a field of fire. Marines crouch in their foxholes and speculate. There is something disturbingly different about this bombardment. The ground shakes as the shell pattern walks back and forth, shattering planes and storehouses, setting off fuel dumps, knocking down trees, terminating men. One 14-inch shell bursts in General Del Valle's command post. Newly arrived soldiers of the 164th Infantry 
wonder if this is what life on Guadalcanal is always like. On the beach at Longa Point, searchlights waver to and fro, seeking the source of this misery. Starshell daubs the darkness with flickering yellow splotches. Five-inch naval guns ashore bark savagely but ineffectively. The battleships are outside their range. Over on Tulagi, Lieutenant Alan R. Montgomery is awakened by the thud of distant explosions. He can do something. Only the day before he had brought four motor torpedo boats to Tulagi for just such an emergency. Montgomery calls his four young skippers all junior grade reserve lieutenants, Henry S. Taylor of PT-46, Robert C. Walk of PT-48 and the Searles brothers, John M. of PT-60 and Robert L. of PT-38. Go get them. All four pile in eagerly. A spirited but baffling action is joined with the Japanese destroyer screen, the PTs firing torpedoes, shooting machine guns and receiving plenty of near misses from five-inch shells. The PT men are certain they are making hits, but what they probably see is the flash of enemy gunfire. The brawl has its effect, however, in helping Admiral Kurita decide to break off. American searchlights have picked up his battleships. He knows not what may develop behind the PTs. He has already been shooting for 80 minutes, and his initial ammunition allowance is expended. So at 2.30 he orders ceasefire and retires according to plan. Congo, Haruna and escorts, untouched by a single hit, slip around Savo Island and head northward for the fleet rendezvous. Kurita knows that his colleague Kusaka will have bombing planes over the field next day, so he has little fear of retaliation from the air. Kurita is right. In the morning, the marines crawl out of foxholes to find yawning chasms spotting the airfield and dispersal areas. Only 42 planes remain operational out of go. The aviation gas supply, critically low before, is nearly all gone. 41 men are deceased, others wounded, and every 15 minutes, Pistol Pete spits up geysers of dirt around the field. Then at noon, without warning, an air raid hits the field hard, followed by another an hour later. Henderson Field is through for the time being. Whoever flies must use the new grass-covered fighter strip. A Marine colonel from Division Headquarters appears at the field and delivers a short pronouncement to the Army aviators. We don't know whether we will be able to hold the field or not. There's a Japanese task force of destroyers, cruisers and troop transports headed our way. We have enough gasoline left for one mission against them. Load your planes with bombs and go out with the dive bombers and hit them. After the gas is gone, we will have to let the ground troops take over. Then your officers and men will attach yourselves to some infantry outfit. Good luck and goodbye. On board Congo, now well to the northward, an orderly hands the Admiral a copy of an intercepted Marine dispatch. Last night we received a terrific bombardment from surface ships. Kurita grunts with satisfaction and thinks of the tremendous victory.